Today, we're going to talk about the opposition that Castro faced in his authoritarian state, which this is always very important to kind of establishing how successful Castro actually was in establishing a true authoritarian state. Now, in Cuba, many factors contributed to the opposition that Castro faced. Um, economic policies that were largely failing um, following the, uh, the rise of the Castro regime, growing authoritarianism, especially as Castro responded to more of this opposition, disillusionment with the progress of the revolution to, to actually acquire some of the things that were promised early on, and the popularity and mythology of Fidel Castro outside of Cuba did not always match what was actually going on in the reality within Cuba. His primary opposition came from former landowners and industrialists prior to the revolution, those that were most economically successful under Batista's regime, obviously. Peasants that were suffering under the uh, realities of collectivization, pro-American Cubans, and many writers and artists who were having to deal with censorship from the government, and academics at the University of Havana that would protest the loss of their academic freedom. Following this rise of Castro, the state would move to restrict those opposition voices. Freedoms of speech and press, um, to the extent that they even existed before the Castro regime, would be eliminated. Show trials would be uh, would be held uh, for political opponents. One uh, famous example is poet Eberto Padilla, who was a Cuban poet critical of the revolution in his work arrested and possibly tortured, um, he was placed before a public show trial where he confessed his supposed crimes against the revolution. Widespread outcry both within and outside of Cuba um, about the treatment of Padilla cost Castro some support at home and abroad. But the persecution of Padilla did have some effect. Artists through the 1970s would enter what was known as the gray period, where they were careful not to produce anything that the state might deem as counter-revolutionary. In 1976, which uh, the Cuban constitution, which we'll talk about in a couple days, would guarantee artistic freedoms so long as they uh, their ideas were not contrary to the revolution. So not exactly free artistic freedoms. Now, that opposition to Castro was largely weak and obviously never successful in bringing down the regime. Uh, there was no united and organized opposition movement, and this divided opposition was unable to coordinate against the government. The opposition movements had little support in Cuba, where the police state and the surveillance state was incredibly strong, and government propaganda was effective at painting opposition as unpatriotic. Harsh treatment of political prisoners and counter-revolutionaries would limit further opposition. In 1961, early in the regime, the Cuban state police would create the General Directorate of Intelligence, or the DGI. This was modeled after the Soviet KGB. Remember, 1961, this is after the United... Uh, after the Soviet Union and Cuba would form a relationship. And this would help in uncovering opposition within Cuba and outside of the Cuban state. Within Cuba itself, in local communities and in many workplaces, what were called CDRs, or Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, were organized to report on counter-revolutionary activities uh, by local communities or within people's workplaces. By 1963, so early in the revolution, a third of the population of Cuba was working for this CDR. So this is now enlisting the public to keep an eye on what others in the public are going to be saying. Military units to aid production were developed in Cuba as places to send political pr prisoners and those accused of counter-revolutionaries to labor camps where they will experience uh, re-education. From 1968 to 19, 1965 to 1968, tens of thousands of Cubans, political prisoners, youngsters who were adopting American styles, homosexuals, uh, were sent to these camps for re-education uh, into the revolutionary doctrine by the government. Now, Fidel Castro throughout his rule um, is said to have um, had to dealt with hundreds of assassination attempts against his life. 
The United States CIA made a number of these attempts to assassinate Castro, um, and then many others came from more local political opponents. Obviously, nothing was successful, and the lack of success became a propaganda tool for Fidel Castro. In the United States in 1975, a congressional committee outlined eight separate attempts by the CIA from 1961 to 65 uh, to assassinate Fidel Castro. Some of them had coordination with the United States Mafia, who had lost a lot of money following the Cuban Revolution and the overthrow of Batista. Um, infected scuba suits, exploding cigars, poison cigars, among other things, were in the plans and some, some attempts for assassination of Castro. Castro's bodyguard, um, a, a guy named Fabian Escalante, claimed that Castro survived over 600 attempts against his life. Now, that is an incredible amount and might possibly have been inflated. Um, however, that number was used as a propaganda tool to show that Castro was untouchable and popular and able to withstand any of this opposition movement in his state. Now, part of what helped Castro eliminate opposition was the the leaving of hundreds of thousands of Cubans through from the beginning of the revolution through the 1980s. Uh, over 350,000 Cubans fled the island following the revolution, most of them to the United States. Some would form cells with hoping to return to Cuba to overthrow the Castro regime. Remember, this is where the Bay of Pigs invasion comes from, made up of over 1,400 Cuban expatriates that hoped to topple the Castro government. Castro used this large population of emigres uh, as justification for the surveillance state that he created in Cuba. He's basically saying, see, we have people within our country that are against the revolution, so we need to keep an eye out for them. They didn't all leave. Castro initially welcomed the departure of many of these uh, anti-Castro Cubans because it would get rid of a problem of opposition in his state. The government also would encourage criminals, uh, sometimes release prisoners, and anti-social Cubans to leave the island, leaving U.S. refugee agencies often feeling like Cuba was dumping its least wanted population on the United States. But the immigration ended up being a problem as many of those that were choosing to leave were some of the most highly skilled and educated Cubans. Um, and this would lead to strict regulations against leaving the island, which we would see uh, in the late 1970s. But sometimes these uh, regulations were reversed. In 1980, over 10,000 Cubans protesting food rations and economic misfortune in Cuba forced their entry into the Peruvian embassy in Havana seeking asylum. Castro pushed a propaganda message that said, let them depart the country in shame. And he announced in, that anybody that wanted to leave Cuba could go. Over 125,000 Cubans ultimately took that opportunity to depart to Florida on what was called the Mariel boat lift. That population also included many prisoners and people that were mentally ill, released from government asylums um, to, to rid the country of what Castro saw as problems in Cuba. And so ultimately, that opposition in Cuba never became anything that could successfully overturn the Castro regime uh, because attempt uh, organization was so limited within Cuba and so many opponents of Fidel Castro simply left the country. Um, and that's all we got for today. We'll come back in a couple of days with some domestic and foreign policies that contributed to Castro's maintenance of power. See you next time.